distinguished guests, community leaders, veterans, fellow soldiers, family, and friends, good morning. On behalf of the Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning, Major General Curtis A. Buzzard and the MCOE Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Jerry L. Dotson, Jr., welcome to today's redesignation ceremony in historic Doughboy Memorial Stadium. Funded by soldier contributions in 1925, this field has sponsored sports events and important ceremonies for nearly 100 years. The medallions on the outside walls represent the symbols of all the combat divisions that served in World War I and honor the troops who served in France and Belgium in 1918. Today, we remember and honor two of the finest Americans our country has ever known as we redesignate this installation as Fort Moore in honor of Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore, Jr. and Julia Moore. Attending today's ceremony are the Honorable Skip Henderson, Mayor, City of Columbus, Georgia, and Mrs. Henderson. The Honorable Brendan Owens, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. The Honorable Carol Inson, County Manager, Talbot County, Georgia. The Honorable Kevin Brown, Mayor, City of Buena Vista, Georgia, and Mrs. Brown. The Honorable Eddie Lowe, Mayor, City of Phoenix City, Alabama. The Honorable Fred Copeland, Mayor, City of Smith Station, Alabama. The Honorable Ron Anders, Mayor, City of Auburn, Alabama. The Honorable Richard Heaton, Mayor, City of Bardstown, Kentucky, and Mrs. Heaton. General Gary M. Brito, Commanding General, Training and Doctrine Command, an Army Senior Representative. Command Sergeant Major Daniel T. Hendricks, Command Sergeant Major Training and Doctrine Command. General Gustavo Acosta, Commander of the Special Operations Group for the Ecuadorian Army. Admiral Michelle Howard, U.S. Navy Retired and Chair, DOD Naming Commission. Colonel Walter Joe Marm, U.S. Army Retired and Medal of Honor recipient. Lieutenant General Ken Keene, U.S. Army Retired. The Honorable Ed Harbison, Georgia State Senator, District 15. The Honorable Debbie Buckner, Georgia House Representative, District 137. The Honorable Teddy Reese, Georgia House Representative, District 140. The Honorable Carolyn Hughley, Georgia House Representative, District 141. The Honorable Chris Blackshear, Alabama House Representative, District 80. Mr. John Hargrove, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Georgia West. Mr. John Phillips, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Georgia North. Ms. Angela Odom, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Georgia North. Commissioner Trish Ross, Georgia Department of Veteran Services. Mr. Michael Brody, Veteran Experience Officer, Department of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Daniel Klipstein, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff, Army G9. Mr. Michael Formica, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff, G357, Training and Doctrine Command. Major General Stephen Smith, Commanding General of the 7th Infantry Division and Mrs. Smith. Command Sergeant Major Timothy Lawless, Command Sergeant Major 7th Infantry Division and Dr. Lawless. Ms. Deidre Dixon, Regional Chief Executive Officer for the American Red Cross and Georgia. Also joining us today are the children of Hal and Julia Moore, Harold Gregory Moore III, Stephen Moore, Julie Orlowski, Cecile Rainey, and David Moore, along with their families. Music for today's ceremony is provided by the Maneuver Center of Excellence Band, commanded by Chief Warrant Officer 5, James Betancourt. Today's vocalist is Sergeant First Class Emily McAllis Jurgens from the U.S. Military Academy Band, accompanied on piano by Sergeant Matthew Twaddle of the MCOE Band. 
The salute battery is from the 198th Infantry Brigade. The officer in charge is First Lieutenant Andre French, and the non-commissioned officer in charge is Staff Sergeant Ryan Lorenz. Two helicopter flyovers will take place during today's ceremony. First, a UH-1 Huey flyover. It's the same aircraft then Lieutenant Colonel Moore used in Vietnam. It will be conducted by the Friends of Army Aviation in honor of Lieutenant General Hal Moore, Julia Moore, and Fort Benning's contributions to the nation for more than a century. Then a UH-60 Blackhawk flyover will be conducted by the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please stand as you are able as the MCOE Command Chaplain, Colonel Scott Kuman comes to deliver the invocation and remain standing for honors and the national anthem. <clears throat> Dear gracious and almighty God in heaven, I thank you for the weather that we are experiencing this day. I petition you for your blessing upon this day and this ceremony. Lord, you are the one who renamed Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, and Jacob to Israel. You gave them new names to give them a new identity and better reflect your purpose and mission for their lives and your people. So today we rename our post in honor of a brave, heroic leader and his extraordinary wife who were full of vision and character. Together, they represented the very best of our local community to better reflect our purpose and mission as the home of infantry and armor. Now, O oh Lord, may you also strengthen us to rededicate our energies individually and collectively, to live out our nation's creed, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And may your blessing rest upon us all as we continue our mission to train warriors to defend our nation. This I pray, O Lord. Amen. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? It's red glare, the bumps bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner head wave, or the You may be seated. The history of Fort Benning goes back more than 100 years when October 7th, 1918, the
first site of the fledgling Camp Benning was established on 84 acres of land off Macon Road in Columbus. It was quickly realized that this site would not be suitable for expansion or training areas and rifle ranges. So on October 19, 1918, the Bussy Dairy, located eight miles south of Columbus, was selected as the new home of Camp Benny and the Infantry School of Arms, where thousands of soldiers would be trained on infantry skills and tactics for the Great War in Europe. By 1940, Fort Benning was now well known as the home of the infantry. It was home to several units preparing for large-scale combat operations as the Second World War continued to rapidly expand in both the European and Pacific theaters. The 1st Infantry Division, 4th Infantry Division, and 2nd Armored Division, led by Major General George S. Patton, Jr., all called Fort Benning home as they trained with the weapons vehicles, and tactics needed to win on the battlefield. On August 16, 1940, the Parachute Test Platoon conducted the Army's first parachute jump over Lawson Army Airfield, ushering in a new era of delivering the infantry to the battlefield. Just under four years later, paratroopers from both the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, who were trained by the Parachute School at Fort Benning, would descend from the early morning skies over Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Fort Benning also played a significant role in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, providing training and support for American troops. When the Korean War broke out on June 25, 1950, the 3rd Infantry Division headquarters and its 15th Infantry Regiment soon departed Fort Benning for combat operations in the Korean Peninsula. Ranger training began in September 1950, expanding into the establishment of the Ranger Department in October 1951, with the first Ranger class graduating March 1, 1952. From November 14 to 16 in 1965, 450 troopers of the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment which had deployed from Fort Benning, led by Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore and Command Sergeant Major Basil Plumley, airlifted into the Yadrang Valley, where they battled thousands of soldiers from the North Vietnamese Army at Landing Zone X-Ray. As a cornerstone of Training and Doctrine Command, or TRADOC, established in 1973, Fort Benning would remain in the forefront of new weapon systems and organizations within the Army. In May 1982, the first two Bradley fighting vehicles arrived and were assigned to the 1st Battalion, 29th Infantry Regiment, tasked with training new Bradley crews and master gunners for the Army. On August 3, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Within a few days, Operation Desert Shield began to defend Saudi Arabia against potential attack by Iraq. Fort Benning trained and mobilized thousands of soldiers who deployed to the Persian Gulf. The 1990 saw Fort Benning support a myriad of peacekeeping and contingency operations around the world. Most notable, U.S. participation in Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, where the Rangers of Company B, 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment participated. After the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the global war on terrorism began, rapidly increasing the training, education, and operational tempo of both the infantry school and other units here at Fort Benning. The 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division, stationed on Kelly Hill, deployed to Kuwait and participated in the ground invasion of Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom in March 2003. The 75th Ranger Regiment, with elements of the 3rd Ranger Battalion, Ranger Special Troops Battalion, and the Regimental Headquarters, conducted continuous deployments in support of combat operations in both Afghanistan and Iraq. All functional courses conducted by the Infantry School quickly grew in response to an urgent need for training in counterinsurgency operations. And during the troop surge in Iraq in 2007, 
Fort Benning quickly adapted to train the increased numbers of infantry soldiers, officers, and NCOs needed for units heading to Iraq. To fulfill the congressionally mandated requirements of the Base Realignment and Closure Act of 2005, Fort Benning and the Infantry School prepared for the arrival of the Armor School and other additional tenant organizations. By 2009, the U.S. Army Infantry Center transformed into the Maneuver Center of Excellence and became the home of both the infantry and armor branches. The 2000 National Defense Authorization, 2021 National Defense Authorization Act set into motion a name change for Fort Benning. The Naming Commission selected names that represent and honor the heroism, sacrifices, and values of Army's men and women. Lieutenant General Hal and Julie Moore were selected as the new Benny namesakes for their meaningful and lasting contributions to our soldiers and the Army. Today, Fort Benning, soon to be Fort Moore, remains a vital military installation serving as the home of the U.S. Army Infantry School and the U.S. Army Armor School, which together make up the Maneuver Center of Excellence. And units including the 75th Ranger Regiment, 1st Security Force Assistance Brigade, Army Marksmanship Unit, and dozens of other tenant units and organizations. This installation has served as a training ground for soldiers from all over the world for more than 100 years and will continue to do so for many years to come. These soldiers of the past represent the legacy of our Army throughout the history of Fort Benning. Please join me in a round of applause for these legacy soldiers who also represent their unit, the 199th Infantry Brigade. At this time, Colonel Colin Malley, the Garrison Commander and Command Sergeant Major Michael Sanchez, the Garrison Command Sergeant Major, will now case the Fort Benning Garrison colors, symbolizing the final chapter in Fort Benning history. The casing of the colors is a traditional ceremony held by U.S. Army commands to commemorate the unit and its history upon the unit's deactivation. The custodian of the colors, Sergeant Major Nicole Brannan, lowers the organizational colors, allowing the garrison commander and garrison command sergeant major to place the case over them. Every command, brigade, or regiment in the U.S. Army has a distinctive flag assigned, which symbolizes a unit's lineage, its honors, and its identity. This flag is known as the colors. This tradition originated for soldiers to recognize the flag or colors of each of their regiments and follow it into battle. When a unit is deactivated and consigned to history, a casing of the colors ceremony is performed. Casing the colors signifies the retirement of the Fort Benning garrison colors. At this time, Private First Class Madison Paul marches the Fort Moore Garrison Colors forward. Colonel Malley and Command Sergeant Major Sanchez will uncase the Fort Moore Garrison Colors, symbolizing the redesignation of this installation. 
The Fort Moore Garrison colors consist of the Installation Management Command, Distinctive Unit Insignia, and Fort Moore Scroll. These colors represent the pride and spirit of the soldiers and civilians who serve under them, providing sustainment, support services, and base protection, ultimately empowering a high quality of life for those who live, work, and rely on the installation and this community. Effective 11 May 2023, Fort Benning is redesignated as Fort Moore in accordance with Section 370 of the William M. Mack Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021 and Army General Order 2023-09. Signed, the Honorable Christine E. e. Warmoth, Secretary of the Army. Fort Moore is designated in honor of Lieutenant General Hal and Julie Moore. Hal Moore graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1945 and retired after 32 years of active service. His notable assignments included occupation duty in Japan, serving with the 82nd Airborne, testing experimental parachutes, NATO, and multiple Army staff assignments. During outpost battles of the Korean War, Hal commanded Rifle and Heavy Mortar Company, served as a Regimental Operations Officer and a Division Assistant Operations Officer, earning two Bronze Star Medals for Valor. In Vietnam, Hal commanded a battalion and a brigade in the 1st Cavalry Division. Following command at the 7th Infantry Division in Korea, Hal commanded the Training Center at Fort Ord, California in 1971. During both assignments, he is credited with solving deeply rooted racial unrest and redeveloping unit level combat effectiveness. 1974, Hal served as the Deputy Chief of Staff for the personnel in the U.S. Army, where he worked to rebuild the non commissioned officer corps, which had been nearly destroyed by the Vietnam War. Fort Moore is unique in recognizing military spouses and families, as personified by Julie Compton Moore. The daughter of Army Colonel Julie lived every aspect of military family life, starting with her birth in the Army Hospital at Fort Sill, Oklahoma in 1929. Julie is most noted for her leadership in supporting Army spouses and families, responding to the flood of casualties notifications after the Vietnam Battle of Ya Drang. Through her efforts, the Army changed its casualty notification policy to require uniformed personnel to deliver the notices, a practice that continues to this day. The Army established the Julie Compton Moore Award in 2005 to recognize civilian spouses of soldiers for their outstanding contributions. From her teenage years, Julie became a lifelong Red Cross volunteer. She led many military community support efforts 
and was an active champion of Army spouses, clubs, daycare centers, and other military support organizations. Her work and contributions distinguish her as one of the most influential military spouses in our military history. Now please join me in welcoming the host for today's ceremony, the Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence and Fort Moore, Major General Curtis Buzzer. Thanks, Steve, and good morning. And it's great having you back on the microphone. And I think the Moors are looking down on us today with some great weather, a little, little overcast, a little breeze, taking care of soldiers once again. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my honor and privilege to be the first to welcome you all to Fort Moore. And thank you for attending this historic event. I can't begin to tell you how truly honored and humbled I am to be the commanding general for this ceremony. This stadium is filled with heroes from every generation, and today we honor two of our nation's very best. Welcome to all of our elected officials and staff representatives, community and business leaders, senior Department of Defense and Army civilians, General Brito, sir, the senior Army representative and former commander here, other active and retired general officers and sergeants major, veterans, senior leaders from the American Red Cross, and I could go on and on. Your attendance speaks to the importance of this event and the great partnership we have with the Chattahoochee River Valley. A few special welcomes, first to the more children, Greg, Steve, Julie, Cece, and Dave, and to your families, over 50 of you. Thank you for making the trip. Thanks for sharing your memories and the stories about your parents to help us even better appreciate their character. Your presence today is the personal touch that gives this momentous occasion a very special meaning. We also have a Medal of Honor recipient in our midst, Colonel Retired Joe Marm, who led 1st Platoon Alpha Company 17 Cav in Vietnam, Lieutenant General Moore's battalion. Welcome also to all the veterans, especially those from 17 Cav, the unit Lieutenant General Moore commanded in Vietnam, and all of the other active and retired soldiers from units that the Moors served with throughout their career. I would also like to personally recognize three World War II veterans that are here from our greatest generation. Gentlemen, when I call your name, would you please raise your hand so we can recognize you? Stephen Melnikoff, who fought in the 175th Infantry Regiment, of the 29th Infantry Division during D-Day landings on June 6th and 7th, 1944, and fought on until the Americans met the Russians on the Elbe River shortly before the German surrender. He was wounded twice during the war and is today 103 years old. Harold Radish. Harold served as a reconnaissance sergeant with the legendary 357th Infantry Regiment, 90th Infantry Division. His unit was overrun on an operation close to the German border, resulting in him being a prisoner of war until the war's end. Harold is 99 years old. And lastly, Donald Cobb. Donald served in the U.S. Navy from 1943 until 1945, aboard the USS Murphy as a radioman. During the D-Day invasion, his ship bombarded German positions off Omaha Beach and provided naval gunfire support throughout the operation. Donald is the youngest of these three at 98. Gentlemen, we are grateful for your attendance. Finally, thanks to all the soldiers, civilians, and family members of Fort Moore who are here today. This is really about you. We gather today to pay tribute to two more American heroes, Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore, Jr., known as Hal, and his wife, Julia Moore, known to friends and family as Julie. Hal and Julie were dedicated to each other, their children, and above all, soldiers and their families and were servant leaders and people of extraordinary character. 
The relationships the Moors created and instilled in soldiers, spouses, in this community during their career, and especially throughout the Vietnam War, were catalysts for the Army and forever changed how we value and take care of our own. The impact they had on families still resonates throughout our ranks to this very day. Prompted by his father, Hal's goal of attending the United States Military Academy at West Point took shape during his teenage years. In 1940, he accepted a patronage position at the Senate Book Warehouse that required him to drop out of high school. So Hal finished school at night. During the day, he stalked the halls of Congress in search of an appointment to West Point. Two years later, he received an appointment to the United States Naval Academy. Supposed to be a little laugh there. Never won for second place, Hal convinced the Georgia congressman. Yeah, that's the laugh right there. there it is. <laughs> Yet, yes, a Georgia congressman to swap an unobligated West Point slot for his Kentucky sponsored appointment to Annapolis. From the beginning, Hal displayed tremendous leadership potential at West Point. It was committed to his values, always exemplifying personal and moral courage. When a fellow cadet, an African-American classmate, Ernie Davis, was to be excluded from a company picnic, Hal immediately objected and threatened to boycott the event. The class respected Hal's gesture and welcomed Davis to the picnic. Later, as the commanding general of Fort Ord, California, during a time of high racial tension, Hal instituted an equal opportunity policy banning discrimination. He did more than talk a good game. Hal held folks accountable. Through his actions, once again, set the example, always emphasizing competence, judgment, and character, with character being the most important. It is well documented that Lieutenant General Moore was a courageous leader who served with distinction in three conflicts, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And specifically, his actions at Landing Zone X-ray in the Yadrang Valley are immortalized in the book, which was later a movie, that he wrote with legendary war correspondent and good friend Joe Galloway, titled We Were Soldiers Once and Young. A former chief of staff of the Army described Hal as, quote, the bravest battalion commander I observed in three and a half years of combat in Korea and Vietnam. Lieutenant General Moore fought as infantry in Korea, as cavalry in Vietnam, and he was a paratrooper with hundreds of jumps. That's the embodiment of the Maneuver Center of Excellence. He was a true hero who inspired his troops to greatness and earned their respect and admiration in return. Because he genuinely cared for them, he loved them and they loved him. Leadership, he said, is not about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in your charge. As a leader, Hal Moore epitomized our Army's values and also developed his own principles of leadership. One of the most being, quote, three strikes and you're not out. He believed leaders must exude self-confidence, a positive attitude, and the will to win, and that there was always one more thing one could do to increase the odds of success. Because in war, he said, there are no second place trophies. Ten General Moore accomplished many things in his life, but none would have been possible without the love and support of his wife, Julie. Much like her husband, Julie Moore was a visionary, a crusader of seeing things done right. It could not have been easy for her. Army spouses and families don't sign on to serve, yet they're called to do just that in support of their soldiers. Soldiers put their lives on the line to protect our country and its citizens. They endure long deployments, dangerous missions, and challenging conditions, often far from home and loved ones. The spouses and families left behind also sacrificed greatly managing households, raising children, and coping with the stress of having their loved one in harm's way. These sacrifices are not only physical, but emotional as well, as they must navigate the, challenge, the challenges of separation and the uncertainty of what lies ahead. Army families of those deployed live a life of waiting and hoping. Most soldiers return, yet some make the ultimate sacrifice. When Julie watched on national television a Walter Cronkite interview of the family of Sergeant Jack Gell, she was distraught when she realized they were notified of his death by telegram, delivered by a cab driver. Not only saddened by the loss, she was upset that she didn't know about the death and wasn't there to comfort the family. 
The tragedy inspired Julie Moore to attend the notifications and the funerals of as many of her husband's fallen soldiers as she could. Only our Gold Star families truly understand the sacrifice and pain of losing a loved one in combat. Later this morning, you'll hear from Sergeant Gell's wife, Mrs. Rebecca Gell Workentine. May I ask Mrs. Workentine and all Gold Star spouses and families in the audience to please stand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these families have endured the unimaginable loss of their loved one, yet despite this incredible cost, paid in service to their nation, they remain steadfast, the embodiment of strength and resilience, and they are an inspiration to us all. We owe them a debt of gratitude for their sacrifice for our nation. Please give them another round of applause. You may take your seats. I would like to ask Sergeant First Class McAleese Jurgens to share one of the Moore's favorite songs, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon as a tribute to our Gold Star spouses and family. Around her neck, she wore a yellow ribbon. She wore it in the springtime and in the month of May. And when you ask her why the heck she wore it, she wore it for her lover who was far, far away, far away. She wore it for her lover far away. Around her neck, she wore a yellow ribbon. She wore it for her lover who was far, far away. Thanks, MJ. The yellow ribbon has become a symbol of support for the military. The lyrics convey a message of hope and represent the connection between military service and the love and support of those left behind. This connection is clear. When a soldier serves, their spouse and family also do. Such was the case with Julie Moore. In addition to being a lifelong Red Cross volunteer, she had a hand in improving services for spouses and families. Her leadership and commitment to supporting soldiers and their families led to the development of what we now know today as Army Community Services. And the, and the modern day casualty notification process. Together, Hal and Julie Moore embody the very best of our military and our nation. And the renaming of this installation as Fort Moore is a fitting tribute to their lifelong dedication to the Army and its soldiers and their family. And by honoring them, Fort Moore also recognizes the sacrifices of all veterans, especially highlighting those from Vietnam. And it also reinforces the important role Army spouses and families play in the success of our military. The Moore name is no stranger to this installation. Hal began his career here. He trained and commanded here. He and Julie raised their family here. Hal and his soldiers stood on this very field before deploying to Vietnam. Julie changed how the Army notified and cared for the families of our fallen here. And ultimately, Hal and Julie chose to be interred in our cemetery here amongst their troopers. Al and Julie's lives came full circle here. They are part of the fabric of this post. As we rename this installation, it's important to remember its proud heritage, which dates back to October 1918. For over a century, this post profoundly impacted our nation and our world, shaping the course of history. The 1920s, then Lieutenant Colonel George C. Marshall overhauled infantry training with a special emphasis on tactics. The 1930s, the Tank Infantry School developed Combined Arms Warfare Doctrine. The 1940s, the Airborne Test Platoon conducted the first military jumps from low altitude. And Lieutenant General Moore's Battalion, 17 Cav, developed air assault tactics with helicopters that were introduced during the Vietnam War. Today, we continue to innovate at light speed with the integration of advanced technologies, new weapon systems and vehicle platforms, and new training and doctrine. As we move forward into the 21st century, we must look to the future and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Our Army and the decisive land power force that trains here will remain integral to the defense of our freedoms and our way of life. Our mission at Fort Moore is central to our Army's success. 
This is where our country's national treasure, its sons and daughters, come to train. And we make a handshake with America every time they arrive. And we maintain the trust and confidence of the American people. New trainees, soldiers, and leaders come here to be better. They come here to begin their careers in the service of their country, to learn the basics from our outstanding drill sergeants, prepare to be non-commissioned officers. They come here to prepare to lead platoons, troops, companies, battalions, squadrons, and brigades. And the leadership lessons they learn here are key. The words of Hal Moore, quote, the most important thing I've learned is that soldiers watch what their leaders do. You can give them classes and lecture forever, but it is your personal example they will follow. Bottom line, we at Fort Moore make our Army better, and the operational force relies on us to deliver. I can't think of a more powerful or important mission, and we must stay on the cutting edge because the character of war, the means and ways we fight, is always changing. But the nature of war remains the same, a brutal contest of wills that demands cohesive teams of soldiers who are fit, disciplined, highly trained, have the will to win, and epitomize the warrior ethos. Because in war, winning matters. As Hal Moore said, there is no second place. And we are at the epicenter of winning at the Maneuver Center of Excellence. This is exactly what we do. Our name may be changing, our mission is not. We will continue to train soldiers and leaders to fight and win in the crucible of ground combat, and there, was, there is no more, more important place to be right now than Fort Moore. Lieutenant General Hal and Julie Moore were courageous leaders and visionaries whose lives exemplified duty, honor, country. And each time we pass through the gates, their legacy will inspire us. The home of the infantry and armor forces will be named after two people who not only embodied, but demonstrated the Army's values, one on the battlefield, the other on the home front. Fort Moore is a name our soldiers and our mission deserve. Because when recruits sign on to be all they can be in the Army, they come here to be more. Let us remember the words of Hal Moore, who once said, the soldier is the Army, and no Army is better than its soldiers. We must continue to take care of our soldiers and their families, and always remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice. This is the example the more set for us. And from this day forth, there's a challenge. We must live up to the more name each and every day. Thank you all again for joining us for this historic event. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Colonel Retired Tony Nadal. Tony commanded Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, and fought in the Yadrang Valley with Lieutenant General Moore. Please welcome Colonel Nadal. General Buzzard, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow troopers in attendance, we were fortunate enough to fight in Vietnam under the leadership of then Colonel Harold J. Moore. Good morning and thank you for today. My name is Tony Nadal, and if you have to go to war, you want to go with the best. We did. It is my privilege today to tell you about my friend and the greatest soldier I've ever known, Lieutenant General Harold J. Moore II. I had the opportunity and good fortune to serve under General Moore's command experience his leadership on many occasions. One such opportunity was when I commanded A Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, during the Battle of LZ X-Ray. Before I extol General Moore's talents, his superb leadership, moral values, and explain why he was the best soldier I ever served with, I wish to recognize some of the folks in the audience who served under his command. These soldiers were instrumental in our survival and success during the Battle of Elsie X-Ray on November 15 and 16, 1965, when our understrength infantry battalion overcame two days of attacks by two and a half North Vietnamese regiments. Will the following gentlemen, colleagues, and friends please stand and as able and remain standing? First, Joe Marr. 
Go. Command in my second platoon. Joe earned the Medal of Honor for attacking the enemy at great risk to his life and destroying a machine gun position where the Viet North Vietnamese were firing on our soldiers. Secondly, Ernie Savage. Ernie was a member of B Company and earned a Distinguished Service Cross. As a young sergeant E5, Ernie's platoon found itself surrounded by enemy forces. Due to, ca due to casualties in the chain of command, Ernie became the platoon leader, a young E5, 22-year-old. Through his competence and courage, he managed to hold the position, prevent more casualties among his troops, and await the arrival of the 7th uh, Cav to, to bring him back home. Next, uh, our, as I said, I commanded A Company. I'd like to present the company commanders of B Company and C Company. Both retired colonels, John Heron and Bob Edwards, uh, commanded companies respectively. They did so with they did so with tireless courage and professionalism. Early during the battle, Colonel Edwards was ser seriously injured when he was shot through the shoulder. With no relieving officer available to reach the uh, company to relieve him, he continued to command and control his company for several hours. I, I personally owe a huge thank to Colonel John Heron, without whom I would never have been able to join 17th Cav, but that's a different story. In addition, I would like to recognize the men who carried rifles and machine guns during our assault, and those who took care of the wounded. May I ask for anyone who fought at LZ X-Ray to join us in standing? Someone, anyone here who was there? Now, would, would all veterans of the Vietnam War please stand? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are my heroes and my friends. Would you please join me in a round of applause for all of them? Thank you. Some great men aren't here to stand with us today because they died in service to the country in the Adrang Valley. One of these men was Sergeant Jack Gale, who was my communications sergeant and good friend. I have to tell you, he was more than that. He was uh, an organizer. He kept my command post running, and he passed away, died in the battle, standing right here next to me. Two other soldiers that were here and here also died at the same thing. Myself and the other radio operator survived. And to this day, I wonder why. How could that be? Two soldiers killed here and one killed here. And I don't say. Uh, with this, I would like to present Jack Gell's wife, Carolyn Workentine. Oh, I'm sorry. Rebecca Workenstein, and she's escorted by her daughter, Caroline. <laughs> Rebecca wrote a poem shortly after she unexpectedly became a young widow. This was understandably a very dark time in her life lives of many young families of the men assigned to the 7th Cavalry Regiment. Becky? Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Rebecca Gell Workentine and I wrote this poem in memory and honor of my late husband, Sergeant Jack Gell. It's called The Angels Cried With Me. The Angels Cried With Me. 
No one knows how much I cried. No one knows how many times I wished I'd died. Is life just a cruel game? A test to see who remains sane? Hours on end staring at the falling rain. Only, uh, only God, the angels, and I feel this pain. The angels cry with me, or so I say. It helps me get through another day. My children ask, Mommy, why are you crying? I hug them close and talk about dying. God leaves us here for a reason. And he calls some home every season. You see, the rain must really be all the angels in heaven crying with me. God called your dad to be with him. I know in my heart he is now one of them. God must have really needed your dad to call him away and leave us so sad. He must have needed him even more than we. One day we'll all know why it had to be. Please understand this was a dark time in my life, a time I wasn't sure if I'd get through. Without the care of my chaplain, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis M. Jackson and his lovely wife, Mary Nell, I found support in the Gold Star Wives and the Army families around me, especially Shirley and Sergeant John Rangel, Jr. I gained strength through my children. Nine and a half years later, I rediscovered love with John working to I discovered purpose while founding the Queen City chapter of Gold Star Wives. I found companionship at gatherings and reunions across the country. And I found great friends like Tony Nadal, who made sure that I was always invited to those reunions. Thank you. And I'd like to present my daughter, my, set, my second daughter, third child. This is uh, Carol Gail Federici. Thank you, Mom, for sharing this deeply moving and impactful part of all of our lives and for being a strong, loving mother and a strong military wife. We suffered the greatest loss a military, I'm sorry, a military family hopes they never have to. It changes your life's trajectory. We sadly never got to know our father, but our mom stood proud and firm in keeping his memory alive with us always. I'm proud to be an Army brat. I'm thankful and grateful for family, military families, and all the incredible soldiers who served along my father, Sergeant Jack Gell. With that, I turn it back over to his company commander, a man we all greatly respect, Tony Nadal. Becky, for your beautiful and inspirational words that have touched my heart and likely many others here today. It's leaders like General Moore who set the example for the rest of us to follow. His character, competence, and professionalism was evident in everything he did and every part of his life. General Moore was the best soldier I ever knew or worked with. Many who served with him in combat in Vietnam share this opinion. I worked with General Moore in several capacities, besides commanding A Company during the Battle of LCU X-Ray, as well as the Bonsom and other battlefields. I was also the S-3 Operations Officer of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, when General Moore commanded the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Cavalry Division. Years later, he assisted me by allowing the Army's organizational effect on his school to be established at Fort Hill, California, when he was post commander there. One of his attributes that I admired a lot is that he didn't command from his helicopter. Colonel Moore led from the ground 
where soldiers could see him, where he shared the danger, and where he could sense the urgency of the situation. He always demanded excellence. When assuming command of 17th Cav, Colonel Moore required all trophies second place or lower to be removed from the trophy case. The goal was to win, he said. There is no second place in combat. General Moore was an officer who best epitomized the West Point motto of duty on our country. He cared about the soldiers and their families. He knew how to talk to soldiers. A great example, one not too many people know about, General Moore, after the return from LZ X-ray and tour of duty in Vietnam, visited the families of our fallen brothers on his own time as his own exempt. He didn't go for accolades. He went because he cared. He also knew the profession of arms, including weapons, equipment, and tactics. He was a student of military art and a reader of military history. He was always alert to changes in the situation and he always told the truth. There were no reports that we were doing better than we actually were. If we weren't doing well at something, he let the world know. That didn't happen very often. As he exemplified at LZ X-ray, as circumstances changed, he remained calm. He didn't shout at people, and his demeanor helped assuage the fears and anxieties of others while inspiring them to performed to the best of their ability. Above all, I want to speak to General Moore's courage and commitment to his troops. An example, an evening of November 15th, an infantry company from the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, was attached to it. The next day, our second day of fighting, Colonel Moore and Sergeant Major Plumley joined that company in an infantry assault which resulted in 26 enemy soldiers killed and the withdrawal of the enemy's attacking force. Colonel Moore's presence with that rifle company was an act of leadership. Through actions, not words, he showed those men that were important. Through his actions, he built teams. Through his actions, we emerged victorious. He made us, all of us, better leaders by his example. Hal Moore was a great soldier and a man I admired. I'm referring him to him as Hal because that's the way I remember him, as my ultimate role model and as my friend of many years. Hal Moore's service made me better. He made his soldiers better. He made the Army better. The naming of his post in honor of Hal and Julie will serve as a beacon to inspire the many young men and women who follow them with honor, integrity, and allegiance in service to the country. One such man who followed Hal's great legacy is Hal and Julie's youngest son, David. David, like his father, is a West Point graduate and retired from the U.S. Army after 27 years of service and the rank of colonel. Please join me in welcoming him today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your great words about my father, Tony, and my mother as well. What a tremendous day for me and our family. General Brito, distinguished guests, Admiral Howard, the naming commission. I'd also like to highlight the men of the 3rd Brigade, 1727, and other supporting units. Thank you for bringing me as Hal Moore's son into, as dad would say, your perimeter and being a member of your perimeter and allowing me to know you and know your service and your honor and your character and your dignity. That's incredibly important. I also like to highlight my West Point class of 1984. We travel well, we party hard. Can I hear something from the class of 84? There we go. Thank you uh, for my classmates who came here not only because it was free alcohol, but because you wanted to see this momentous occasion. On behalf of my siblings, Greg, Steve, Julie, Cecile, thank you for being here. We believe the redesignation of Fort Benning is unique in that by Hal and Julie Moore's example, we recognize Army families 
as essential to Army readiness and mission accomplishment. Among all bases, Fort Benning stands alone since this redesignation is not solely about a name or one person's achievements, but instead it is about personal character, represented by Army values, reinforcing the fundamental truth that soldiers fight as a team. On the battlefront, that team is their small unit. On the home front, that team is their family. In our home, mom and dad were the nucleus of our family. And the great love they shared for one another radiated to everyone in their orbit. In recognition of their love for each other, I'd like to share with you one of their favorite songs. Anytime they were at home and, and Ann Murray's Could I Have This Dance came on the radio, they would stop what they were doing and dance together. Sergeant First Class McAleaster again has offered to sing us a rendition for us today. song that was playing the first time we danced and I knew as we swayed to the music and held to each other I fell in love with you could I have this dance for the rest of my life could you be my partner every night when we're together it feels so right could I have this dance for the rest of my life oh and when we're together it feels so right could I have this dance for the rest Thank you, Sergeant MJ. After hearing her in the rehearsals, I told her she has to get on Spotify because I want to hear all her, her music and her, her wonderful, wonderful voice. Mom and, dad, Mom and Dad's life was founded upon love. Love of God, their country, and love of the Army. My Army, as they would say. We remember our parents because of this love and how they helped us grow and mature. That love is what we sincerely hope becomes the strength and foundation of Fort Moore. My two older brothers recall that when our family moved to a NATO assignment in Norway, dad chose to put both boys, ages eight and nine, in a Norwegian school. Not knowing the language, they were on their own to figure it out. Steve remembers his first class was in French, taught in Norwegian to a kid who understood neither language. On one occasion, Greg was with his schoolmates in Oslo, and a lost American couple came up and asked if they, anyone spoke a little English. The Norwegian kids promptly pointed to Greg, who provided directions in perfect American English. As the couple departed, he heard them say, these Norwegian kids are really smart. That boy speaks excellent English. My father would not hesitate to put us in positions that demanded personal initiative and confidence. The very same attributes he expected of his soldiers. Mom and dad taught us to embrace uncertainty and go find the answers. Mom would always say, bloom where you were planted. We proudly call ourselves army brats. How we live the army life with mom and dad is fundamental to our outlook on adversity, change, and love. Amidst the turbulence of military life, our parents strove to maintain love and stability. It was the little things that with time and perspective were the big things. They shipped Julie's beloved parakeets and hamsters to Korea and back when other parents might have simply rehomed them. Mom even made an emergency run to a pet store when a parakeet suffered an untimely death 
to be talked about later, uh, before the reception that they were hosting General Westmoreland. Love, support, and commitment. Even when the logic of the situation would otherwise dictate an it can wait moment. Our parents instilled a love for physical fitness, the outdoors and travel in all of us. Dad was proud Greg and Steve became the youngest Americans to receive a gold medal from the Norwegian Ski Association for skiing 500 kilometers in a single winter. While assigned to Boston, we fished in New Hampshire. On one trip, I dropped the fishing pole overboard. Dad was concerned about losing a, quote, sensitive item. He volunteered my brother Greg to dive into the frigid water, and after repeated attempts, Greg exploded to the top with the fishing pole. I suspect my father subsequently secured the pole to my wrist with 550 cord, a skill that would come in handy years later at Ranger School. We fished, hiked, picnicked, and skied at many locations along our journey. While my sister Cecile was in high school, she was determined to go on a class ski trip, even though she'd never been on a ski slope. Dad found a local shop to teach her some basic moves that allowed her to survive the treacherous bunny slope. Of course, we children knew little of the demands of his work. Mom and Dad had very little free time, and yet they created these special moments for each of us. One of mine and Teresa's fondest memories now, but not then, was a chance encounter with Mom and Dad on Victory Drive in 1985. As we stopped by the side of the road to chat, Teresa kept her left hand deeply buried in her pocket. As I had not told my parents, I had popped the question and she was wearing an engagement ring. Mom zeroed in on that hand and in an instant, there was no fooling that woman. When my sister was living with my parents in Auburn with her two small children, mom and dad welcomed the opportunity to provide a positive living environment for the girls. This time, my sister Julie dubbed our father Captain Fun. This was a title and way of life that both mom and dad embraced for the remainder of their lives. Mom would walk her grandchildren to an ancient oak tree and picnic with them, making up stories of who else sat underneath that tree. My parents firmly believed a leader's core responsibility is establishing a vision and creating a future. Upon retirement, the future they created themselves reinforced their core faith and character beliefs. They reoriented their lives to engaging with grandkids and skiing the Colorado mountains. Mom took her first job at the age of 49 as a cashier at a gift shop in Crested Butte, Colorado. She loved smiling and greeting countless visitors daily, convincing them to buy yet another pair of sunglasses a task that would have driven my introverted father to complete surrender. It was well known secret that dad attended social events to gather intel on local fishing spots. My parents faith in God was paramount. To quote dad, the purpose of our lives on this earth is to make the cut for heaven. In his final years, the priests of St. Michael's Catholic Church would visit and offer communion. During one visit, the priest asked Dad if he'd like to confess any sins. Dad thought for a minute, he was quiet, and popped up and said, can't think of anything. We all had a good laugh. Mom and Dad made the cut. They loved us, they loved the Army and soldiers. They were truly a command team whose service did not end upon retirement from active duty. Honoring battlefield commitment, Mom, Dad, and Joe Galloway began to write, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Across the 10 years of research and writing, their effort allowed the Idrang troopers and relatives to renew their brotherhood, share their memories, and assuage their pain. My parents' phone number was public. Troopers would call the house, and more often than not, they would talk to Mom rather than Dad. We still feel their presence. Julie seems to get most of the signs from mom and dad these days. Mom loved butterflies. So when we see a butterfly, we say, hi, mom. Our family is deeply grateful that
that our parents will be honored, remembered, and held as role models for the generations of Army soldiers in these stands and to come. They loved each other. They loved us. They loved the Army and their beloved troopers, so much so that my father's last wish was to be buried among his troopers here at the Post Cemetery. The same troopers my mother referred to as their sons and brothers and with whom she is buried as well. Major General Buzzard, honored guests, thank you so much for having us on this great day. And as dad would say, drive on. And now the more children join Major General Buzzard and Command Sergeant Major Dotson, Colonel Malley and Command Sergeant Major Sanchez on the field for the unveiling of the Fort Moore signs. Please also direct your attention to the screens on the field. On your left, the 2022 MCOE Drill Sergeant of the Year, Sergeant First Class Thomas Harris and his family, wife Blanca, and daughters Emma and Evelyn will unveil the Alabama Stone Gate sign for Fort Moore. And on your right, the 2023 AUSA Family of the Year for the Chattahoochee Valley, Lieutenant Colonel Courtney Dean, Commander of 1st Squadron 16th Cavalry Regiment, and his family, wife Tut McCracken, and sons Connor, Colin, and Killian Dean will unveil the Legacy Boulevard Stone Gate sign in Georgia. These unveilings were filmed in advance for the ceremony. And now for the unveiling, may I ask everyone, please join me in a countdown at five, four, three, two, one. Welcome again to Fort Moore, Georgia, home of the Maneuver Center of Excellence. You have just seen a UH-1 flyover tribute by the Friends of the Army Aviation. The UH-1 or Huey is the aircraft, then Lieutenant Colonel Moore and his troopers of the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment rode into battle in Vietnam. Please keep your eyes on the sky. We're in a moment of formation of UH-60s. These Black Hawk helicopters are how today's soldiers arrive on the cutting edge of battle to close with and destroy the enemy. Together, these aircraft represent our past, present, as we move forward as Fort Moore. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as you are able and join in the singing of the Army Song led by Sergeant First Class McAleese Jergens accompanied by the Maneuver Center of Excellence Band. Please sound off with me. March along, sing a song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true. Take your seats. On behalf of the Maneuver Center of Excellence and Fort Moore, Commanding General Major General Curtis Buzzard, we thank you for your attendance at today's ceremony and express many thanks to all who made this day possible. 
Please remain in your seats as the extended Moore family takes an official photo in front of the Moore sign. The ushers will direct you when you may leave. The Moore family will be leaving to your right, and we ask that the rest of the visitors please exit the stadium to your left. As you are waiting, please note a new Moore Gallery opens at the National Infantry Museum at 1 o'clock this afternoon. All are welcome to attend. In a few minutes, the Moore Documentary will air for those who wish to remain in the stadium. Thank you again for being part of this historic occasion. May we continue to honor the legacy of Hal and Julie Moore and the Army as we move forward as Fort Moore, one force, one fight, be all you can be, and be more.